Yeah, I can't, it was a client question, actually. Uh, the person was, was really just interested in what kind of ideas we had to invest in gold specifically. Um, and I, I thought it was a good enough question that I wanted to really kind of dive deep into it. And we, we do have some recommendations that we've discussed before that are indirectly um, operating within the, within the gold mining space, um, say as a processor or a miller. But generally speaking, we don't really love to invest in mining companies. And there's a couple of reasons for that. So one of those reasons is just that they're they're obviously so commodity price sensitive, right? Like everything about the business is really going to revolve around the commodity price. If the commodity price goes up, they have an opportunity to produce better revenue and cash flow. Uh, if the commodity price goes down, it doesn't matter what your asset looks like. You're likely going to produce um, a lot less cash flow or even go quickly to negative cash flow. Now, obviously, any company has some susceptibility to macroeconomic conditions. Um, but commodity prices like like gold and metals, uh, oil and gas are particularly volatile. Um, they fluctuate uh, quite widely, even throughout a single business cycle. Um, but there's also another reason as well, and that's that mining companies themselves aren't necessarily great proxies to the price of the underlying commodity. So we'll just take uh, an example for with with the price of gold, right? So this is a, a 10 year chart. Um, on just the price of gold, the commodity price. And, um, you know, there's areas of flatness, but, you know, generally a uh, um, fairly decent upswing from, you know, around $1,300 per ounce 10 years ago to just under 2000 per ounce right now. Now I'm gonna compare this to the price of the largest gold mining company in the world, which is Barrett Gold ABX. Um, and the price looks completely different. So you would think that, you know, being a large diversified mining company, um, that would you know result in you being a good proxy to the price of gold or perhaps um perhaps you'd be more volatile than the prices price of gold but you would go up more when the gold price goes up maybe down more um but you really see very little resemblance between these two charts barrack is extremely volatile extreme extremely fluctuative um and it doesn't look from the chart just looking at it like it's really produced much of a return at all over the past 10 years now, if we break these numbers down and compare them, the one year, the three year, the 10 year return, uh, gold, the price of gold is up about 7% over the last year compared to Barrick's share price, which is down 13%. Um, gold is up about 10% over three years. That's not per year, that's not compound um, annual, that's just 10% over three years compared to Barrick, which is down 40% over three years. And then if you look at the 10 year return, Gold is up about 56% and Barrick is up about 25%. Now, these returns don't include dividends um, and Barrick does pay a small yield. So when you add the yield in, certainly for the 10-year return, that's going to explain uh, a lot of the differential here. Um, but another thing that we also have to consider is that Barrick's share price has been so volatile over the last, uh, over the last decade that you know, if we were to just basically start our calculation even a couple of weeks before um, the date, uh, which would be June of 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 twenty of, of 2013, the ten year return. If we were to just you know start that calculation or adjust it out a month back, you would get a completely different return. Um, it just so happens that we're calculating the return based off of a point in time when Barrick's share price had come down significantly. So, you know, it's really like just looking, pinpointing that 10 year return on Barrick. I mean, a nine year return, a 10.5 year return is gonna look completely different. So much more volatility in the gold miners price. Um, and then if you look at this as well on a risk adjusted basis, so return um, as, you know, you know, also factoring in the volatility of prices, um, you can see that that gold on a risk adjusted basis has 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 produced far better performance than than Barrick Gold. Um, and I'm using Barrick here as a proxy for mining companies. You know, some mining companies, I'm sure, perform better, others worse. Um, but it just goes to show that, you know, investing in a mining company, it brings all of the risks of the underlying commodity, but it also brings a lot of other risks. Um, but there there is another option that I wanted to explore for our client here. Um, for investing in a stock that has exposure to the gold price. And that is looking at gold royalty stocks and gold streaming stocks. Again, this is not a space that we're incredibly active in, um, but I felt it was worth a bit of a dive to see what was out there 
and what the opportunities were. So a royalty or a streaming company, it's essentially, essentially a, a, like a specialized finance company. And what they do is they provide upfront capital to the mining companies in exchange for royalty um, on their production or just the right to purchase mined gold or whatever other metal they're investing in um, at a fixed price. So if the price of gold increases, um, then they're then they're generating a margin off of that. So royalty stocks, one of the reasons why I like that structure a little bit better is because they have far less operating risk. They are less capital intensive in terms of you know what is required to build a mine. Mining is an extremely complex endeavor. Um, I really feel that in many ways you have to be a bit of a specialist to fully understand what's happening if you want to have a good conversation with uh, the management company management team of a mining company. Um, so royalty stocks just tend to have a much cleaner structure, higher margins, and they generally have the ability to produce more stable cash flow. Now, the flip side to that is that uh, royalty stocks generally trade at much more expensive valuations relative to mining stocks. Uh, and this reflects that cleaner, um, more, some, more easy to understand operating structure and those higher margins. Now, with mining companies, you can often find, especially small cap mining companies, trading at very low multiples of maybe only uh, two or three times cash flow, sometimes even less. Uh, a lot of times, though, this also factors in the risk that it's a, a very undiversified company. Um, there may be issues with reserve life or uncertainties in that area. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to look at specifically at gold royalty and streaming stocks, see what's available and just get a bird's eye view or a high level view of the of the fundamentals so i did my searching and what i um what i identified i identified six gold royalty companies uh that are trading in north american markets now there are a couple other companies that um that are that do list themselves as a as a gold royalty or streaming company they didn't make this list the reason why they didn't make this list is because they would not have been profitable or cash flow positive or perhaps producing very marginal cash flow. But these are the only six companies in the royalty space which are meaningfully profitable, producing meaningful levels of cash flow. That's Franco Nevada, uh, Wheat and Precious Metals, Royal Gold, Osisco, Triple Flag Precious Metals, and Sandstorm. Now, if, uh, if somebody thinks that I've made a mistake here, that I'm missing something, then by all means, put, put the name of the company in the comments. I'll take a look at it um, and I'll follow up in the comments or maybe even on the next show and just give a quick analysis of that company. But from what I can see, anything that was called a royalty company outside of these six didn't produce the profitability that I really felt they were worth an analysis. So um, all six of these companies with the exception of one, so five of these companies trade both in the on the Canadian market and the US exchange. Um, Royal Gold, Gold is the only one that just trades on the U.S. exchange. It trades on the NASDAQ. So I have the companies here in order of market cap. Franklin, Nevada is the largest company by market cap, about $28 billion, followed by Wheat and Precious Metals, $20 billion, um, all the way down to $8 billion for Royal Gold. Uh, and then $2.9 billion is the market size of a Cisco and Triple Flag. And Sandstorm is the smallest of the group with a market capitalization of $1.6 million. And then in terms of yields, they all pay a yield. Um, not, none of these yields are particularly impressive. They range from 0.9% for Frank, Franco Nevada up to 1.4% for Triple Flag. Um, all these companies are basically in that range of about 1%. So there are different ways that we can analyze the performance of these companies. What I'm going to focus on here is I'm going to focus on growth in operating cash flow per share. Um, I'm going to look at growth in the recent quarter last year and then compound growth over a three year period. Um, so, you know, for a lot of these companies, it's a little bit over the map. So Franco Nevada uh, down, cash flow per share was down about 9.3% in the quarter, um, you know, a little better than flat for the year, but very impressive three year growth. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the opposite case for a Cisco, which had a very strong quarter of cash flow per share growth, um, but then down for the year. Um, and then lackluster uh, for the three year. Um, you know, wheat and precious metals uh, down 36% for the quarter, down 12% for the year, compound growth of 13% over three years. Uh, Royal gold, a little more consistent here, about 7.5% growth in the quarter, 
Um, negative 9.7% for the year, but compound growth of 18% over three years. Um, triple flag, again, more stability here, up about 20% for the quarter, down 6.4% for the year, and compound growth is 6.4%. Now, the company that has the most consistent track record of growth over all these periods, that would be the smallest company, that's Sandstorm Gold. 14% uh, growth in cash flow per share for the quarter, 10%, 10.6% for the year, and then compound growth of 3% or 13% over a three-year period. Now, I'd mentioned before that uh, royalty companies tend to trade at higher valuations. We can see that by looking at the price to operating cash flow um, for these companies. So this is operating cash flow over the last 12 months. Um, the highest in the group would be Wheat and Precious Metals. So they traded about 31 times cash flow. Franco Nevada, uh, a Cisco, both right around that 30 times range. Um, triple flag trading at 22 times cash flow. Royal Gold a little bit better at 19. And then the cheapest in the group is Sandstorm Gold, which again also happens to have the most consistent financial performance in the group as well. Um, so that's 13 times cash flow. So that really is not based on my experience of looking at royalty stocks in the past. That's actually not a bad valuation to cash flow, especially considering that the company has had pretty consistent growth. So again, this is not an in-depth analysis. This is a bird's eye view of the entire space um, so that we can essentially identify some areas that we want to investigate further. Now, if I were to just look at the growth in cash flow and the valuation, then the standout to me would definitely be Sandstorm Gold. As I said, consistent growth over a period of time and what I would consider to be you know, fairly attractive valuation for a royalty company. However, when we look at the balance sheet, uh, we need to factor some other things in like debt, like how are these companies financing themselves? So Frank Nevada, Franco Nevada, Wheaton, both have net cash balances, but Royal Gold, Gold of Cisco and Triple Flag, they even though they have net debt on their balance sheet, it's a very manageable level of net debt. Um, net debt to cash flow multiples all below one times um, basically almost zero for a Cisco. So these are very stable balance sheets, good solid financial positions. Sandstorm, on the other hand, in spite of it being the smallest company in the group, has the highest amount of net debt, uh, $470 million, and a net debt to cash flow multiple of 3.8 times. So that's a pretty heavy multiple. I mean, especially when you're comparing it to the group. Um, and then as well, when you're considering the fact that this is uh, a cyclical industry as well. Um, there is some exposure to the price of gold here. So that really explains perhaps the value valuation discount um, that we're seeing um, relative to the other companies is that Sandstorm is a company with greater leverage. Now, um, I still think that the valuation, the growth, uh, you know, the, the, the future potential of Sandstorm is worth some further investigation if we wanted to dig deeper. Um, but if I think if I had to pick one of these companies right now that's just stood out, um, with decent metrics across the board, it would probably be Royal Gold, which uh, which is is perhaps not coincidentally the only company that does not trade on a Canadian exchange. Um, and I, I pull that out just because, you know, it does have that good solid balance sheet. Um, it does have, you know, decent growth in the last quarter, decent growth over three years, and then valuation of 19 times cash flow doesn't seem like it's too stretched to me. From a market size perspective, it's about right in the middle of the group. I know from looking at their company presentation, they think they're big enough to um, take advantage of some of the larger opportunities out there to get royalty streams, but they're also small enough to put up decent amounts of growth. So this is by no means a recommendation, um, but it's certainly an interesting name. Um, I would look further into Royal. I'd look further into Sandstorm um, and probably Triple Flag for Precious Metals as well. Yeah, it's interesting. We actually uh, included Sandstorm um, just as a monitor report in our 2022 uh, cash rich report because, you know, it's interesting to, to see at that time they did actually have a cash rich balance sheet or I mean, it wasn't a huge cash rich position or anything, but they, they did have net cash. Um, but since then, obviously, you know, they've, uh, they've dipped into that net debt. And it's cool too, Aaron, just that you did bring up, you know, the uh, the multiples, because even in, you know, my report um, or in the report that I wrote on Sandstorm, uh, on Sandstorm, I ended up uh, including 
um, the comparables, essentially, including, you know, exactly the companies that you brought up, you know, Frank and Franco Nevada, Wheat and Precious Metal, Royal Gold, Osisco, Triple Flag, and really all of the valuations have stayed, you know, relatively the same. Um, but at that time, uh, again, um, Sandstorm was trading with a trailing or sorry, it was a forward uh, price to FFO or funds from operation of about 13 times. So, you know, a year ago, we're still seeing kind of that discount uh, on the company. Um, and again, it is uh, quite small, but uh, but yeah, no, good job. I thought that. Uh, and that was, was a forward that FFO? was a FFO. This was. A I wonder if they hit that right. F FFO estimate. That's um, the question. We should, uh, yeah, I should uh, take a look. Um, you know, but yeah, I, I guess I should uh, take a look and see. If well, uh, not, not that you have to pull it up right now, but I wonder if that hit and if you know. I mean, it, it depends on where the price of gold is, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Let, let's move on. I mean, was there any more comments, Aaron? It was a good summary. Um, I think that that did more than enough to answer the client's question, essentially, on totally. on uh, gold royalties. I mean, I think, like, you summarized the, the performance of Barrick. I do think if you want to play this segment long term, a good high quality royalty company is a better way to go often than one junior minor or even one senior mid tier minor that uh, has that one or two mine exposure. Uh, I think that this is a great way to play it. Franco Nevada over the long term has been a good example of that. 